Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Well, this one's going to end the entire series. It's about the end of the universe. So this is a good way to end the series on introductory astronomy. And this is going to go a lot of really crazy spots. So let's see what happens. So this time we're going to be talking about the way the universe will end. And so this is, again, the class could be entitled A Million Ways to Get Killed, but this is the way the universe gets killed. So let's see how it dies. Isn't this interesting? Okay, so next, first things first, we're going to talk about the, we have to incorporate and reincorporate the concept of general relativity as applies to the entire cosmos. As we learned before, we know that general relativity says that space-time tells mass how to move and mass tells space-time how to curve. And from our previous discussions about the Big Bang and all sorts of things, the expansion of the universe, we learned that if the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, and it can be described by a relatively simple metric, and that metric says how the universe will expand and with time. And so how it expands with time depends on what's in it. So the mass and space and energy that's embedded inside the cosmos will tell the universe how it should curve and also how it should expand as well. All right, so the fate of the universe depends upon its contents. As we said, it has to be homogeneous and isotropic. And it will, if, it's, if it is homogeneous and isotropic, there's only two possibilities. Actually, there's a third. It can expand or contract uniformly across the entire universe. And that's the nature of the assumption underneath the Friedman, Robertson, Walker metric, which posits an isotropic, homo, isotropic homogeneous universe on the largest size scales. Now, of course, the flow of the expansion is halted because inside of like the Earth, because the Earth is gravitationally bound, so it also is the Milky Way, so is the local group, so is the local supercluster. But when you get size scales much larger than the Haniakea supercluster, then you are expand, experiencing the, the expansion of the cosmos. And that's uniform and uh, uniformly across the cosmos. All right. The other way of possibility is if it was completely standing still, then it would stand still forever, but that's an unstable situation. So if there was a tiny, tiny, tiny change, then the standstill would either expand or contract. So the contents of the universe depend dictate what's going to happen. And in the simplest possible models of the universe, in which I grew up with and dealt with when I was in college and, and, and grad school, was that the universe was only considered to have matter in it, matter and light. Those are the only things that people thought they were. And in fact, people understood that the energy density due to light and radiation, or more specifically ultra-relativistic things like neutrinos and so forth, contributed not as much uh, energy density to the cosmos as regular matter and cold dark matter. So if cold dark matter and normal matter were the only thing, then the destiny of the universe would depend 100% on the density of the matter. And for a high density universe, for a very, very high density universe, uh, greater than the critical density, then it would collapse back down eventually to a big crunch meaning, the, ex meaning the, uh, the expansion would slow down and then reverse if the density of the universe were greater than the critical density and it were completely made of normal or dark matter. If it were lower density than, the universe, than, than critical or flat, then the universe, and composed only of dark matter and normal matter, then the universe would eventually get larger and larger and larger and expand and expand and expand and, and in fact expand forever. And its rate of expansion would gently increase, but it would certainly expand forever. And that's called an open universe. And that would mean a big freeze. So pretty much the idea was, when I was in grad school in the 90s, was the idea was people were trying to measure the matter density of the universe and therefore how fast the universe was decelerating. And that was the uh, that was the big idea is that, that the matter was what was in the universe. So the density is the destiny. So people wanted to know how long in the future it was for a, before a big crunch, or how long it was in the future before a big freeze. That was the ultimate concept of the 1990s, and that was one of the reasons why the Hubble Space Telescope was launched to determine the this what we're going to talk about today. So we, this particular graph shows the scale factor. Now remember, the scale factor shows the rate of it is shows the the expansion of the universe now as opposed to then or later compared to now. 
And so the y-axis on this graph could be the scale factor, meaning how much bigger tomorrow it will, how many times bigger it'll be tomorrow than it is today. And that's, that's what we define to be the scale factor. Today at now, we define the scale factor to be one. Remember the scale factor though, was defined by the redshift. So the redshift itself, remember it would Hubble, went back and looked at the expansion of the universe and discovered it and discovered that every galaxy had a redshift. So this V of redshift, meaning the speed of the redshift or the recession velocity, that is the V in redshift, is equal to the speed of light times the redshift value that was measured. Remember the redshift value here is defined to be the ratio of the scale factors of now and ago, so that high redshift means smaller scale factor. Remember redshift is directly related to the change in wavelength compared to the original wavelength. That's the definition of redshift. We also then related the redshift to then the scale factor. So if we look, we find that importantly, the expansion velocity then is related to what we call the Hubble cut, the Hubble parameter, which is h of h as a function of time, and d, the distance between two objects, as a function of time. So the velocity, the recession velocity, as a function of time, that's what that parenthesis t means, is equal to the time derivative of a, meaning a dot, and a dot simply says, how does the scale factor vary as a function of time, as the universe ages, or how, how was, what was the scale factors, how has it changed with time compared to today? So that's what the a dot over a means. How has the scale factor changed with time compared to the, the scale factor itself? So whatever the scale factor is at a given time, how did it, how is it currently changing? with respect to that moment. And that gives you the Hubble parameter as a function of time of distance today to a given object. All right, so we can then say a very interesting thing. We really don't know a priori how the universe scale factor changes with time. We really don't know that. So the scale factor itself is kind of unknown, so we don't know it. Since we don't know it, we can use a mathematical trick. And this mathematical trick is called a Taylor expansion. And this is commonly used all throughout mathematical physics. Where what you do is you say, I have no idea how this particular thing is a function of time or distance or space or what have you. You just have no idea. But what I can do is I can say, well, I know it doesn't vary wildly. I know it doesn't vary crazy time. So what I can do is I can take first and second derivatives of that function with respect to time, multiply it by the time that it's changed by, and we can see, okay, take the scale, so we take the scale factor, a as a function of time, and say, well, what is it today? a is a function of t naught, and t sub zero is the time today. So we can say it's equal to that. Fine, so how has it changed, been changing as a function of time? Now, how is it changing now? And then multiply that by the difference in time you're trying to measure, meaning t minus t naught, meaning ago compared to today. Then you add on to that the second derivative, derivative with respect to time, and that's usually called an acceleration times the uh, difference in time squared. And this sum goes on forever. It's an infinite sum, and it's called a Taylor expansion. I invite you to look it up if you want. However, what we can do is we can say this is just a way of saying we have no idea how a as a function of time actually works. So we're going to do a mathematical approximation of it, assuming that we can actually, that it doesn't vary very crazily. And that's called a Taylor expansion. It still is a function of redshift and time and so forth. But right now we're we say it has a function of time, but we really don't know what it is. All right, so then we assume it's that smooth, we assume it is smooth, it's not wild, and so we can shorten the infinite sum to just the first few terms, because if it's not wild, then those little terms are going to be very, are going to vary very, very short period, very small, because a very tiny difference in time, say the t minus t naught, will become really small as time goes on, and the higher derivatives, meaning the, the the, the change of scale factor with respect to the change of the scale, scale factor with re respect to the change of the scale factor with respect to time. You mean like a to the, to the it, a, so how it changes multiply with respect to time. Those things are very small changes. So we don't really notice them. So there's not a really big acceleration. There's not a really big change in acceleration. There's not a really big change in the change in acceleration. So basically it's moving really smoothly. 
So if we do that, then we can approximate that infinite sum with this very simple little equation. And that's what the twiddle is, as the a is approximately equal to. That's why we make the bendy line equals. The bendy line equals says that we're making it approximately equal to. And we're also doing, we're saying that the scale factor of today equals 1. So that's okay. We, we've known that. We've done that all the time. So that if we have the scale factor today, the scale factor of any time is, equal, is approximately to 1 plus the Hubble constant, which we measure today, times the time compared to today's time, minus a half times this new thing, Q0, times the Hubble parameter squared times the time squared. So we kind of keep that Hubble thing squared. So we have this one thing there, but we square it. But then the Hubble, the, the Q0 is a new thing. And notice we changed the plus to a minus, but all right, that's fine. So we can make a new definition. And this is an approximation, and we define a bunch of things based upon that. So what's this Q0? Q0 is called the deceleration parameter. And it came back, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it arose because back in the 1950s, people knew that the, Hub, that the Hubble constant wasn't necessarily constant. Or they said, well, perhaps it isn't constant. Perhaps the scale factor and the rate of change of the cosmos expansion has changed with time. So what they did is they said, fine, let's do a Taylor expansion. And somebody, somebody figured, well, the universe should be slowing down because it's got a bunch of matter in it. So this was back in the 1950s. And people said, so if the universe is going to be slowing down, we want to see how fast it's decelerating. So Q0 was called, back in the 1950s, the deceleration parameter. And people thought the universe back then was closed that it was going to collapse back in on itself. It was more philosophical than anything else, and also because they didn't understand the size scale of the cosmos at the time. But it made, seemed to make sense at the time. So they defined it to be uh, the, the deceleration parameter. So they wanted to know when the big crunch, or the, when, the, when the deceleration would turn around and how long the universe would live. So Q sub naught is defined to be, and that's what the three bars mean, is defined to be the negative of the second derivative of the scale factor, that's what the a double dot means, times the scale factor divided by the first derivative with respect to time of the scale factor squared. And that's kind of a weird way of talking about it. It's a very strange definition, but it allows us to then say, ah, look at, we, that actually ends up being the acceleration of the, the scale factor is a, a unitless number, so it's not actually a t distance. It is a factor that you multiply a distance by in order to see how big it is tomorrow as opposed to today. So the scale factor then has a double dot over an A, over the A, and that means it's a second, it's an acceleration. It's a change of time and it, per second, per second, per year, per year, what have you, compared to the scale factor. And that's divided by the Hubble parameter, and that's how it's all been defined. And so that's been inserted. That Q0 goes back into that equation. And this is the definition of the deceleration parameter. And it measures how quickly or how slowly the universe is changing its Hubble parameter. I remember the Hubble parameter said that Edwin Hubble said it is going at 70 kilom roughly 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that's a linear relationship. That's what he found. But back in the 1950s, when people really had no idea, they said, fine, the universe is expanding. There's a scale factor. If that's the scale factor, then maybe there's a change in the scale factor. So let's create the deceleration parameter because it's got to be slowing down because matter pulls on matter. So it's expanding. It's probably slowing down. So let's define it this way. And so they did. Now the deceleration parameter can then be plugged back into another very important equation from general relativity. And that is the one of the other fundamental equations that arises from general relativity and cosmology and the simple, con the simple concept of an isotropic, homogeneous, expanding universe is that the acceleration parameter, double a double dot, compared to the, to the scale factor, the, what's on the left hand side we call it acceleration equation, is equal to some crazy bunch of numbers, 4 pi times the gravitational constant divided by th uh, 3 times the speed of light squared. And that big sigma, that big letter E, which is a Greek sigma, means the sum of. And the little w means a bunch of things like w, sum of all w's, where 
The sum is the things to the right. And E is the energy density of one parameter of W. So maybe energy parameter of this or energy density of that. And then times 1 plus 3 W. So every energy density does something different to the acceleration parameter. Now, for normal matter, like, like atoms and molecules and even dark matter, the W is zero because it doesn't do and it, it, it doesn't doesn't do anything different to the acceleration. Either it's there or it's not. It pulls by gravity. It does nothing any different. So it just behaves like normal energy density that we perceive. For radiation, like light or neutrinos, W is equal to one-third. So that changes the little thing to the, to the right, so that becomes 2EW, right? So you get this one-third, and that's what, two times EW. So whatever the energy density E sub W is for or radiation, whatever that is, that's what it is. It's twice that. That's ex which, so it contributes twice as much to the acceleration as normal matter. And then if we say some concept like dark energy, or more specifically what Einstein called a cosmological constant, we would plug in W is minus one. So then that becomes a, if W is minus one, then that thing on the right becomes negative two. And then the acceleration, if you look closely, it becomes positive. And that becomes the, instead of a deceleration, this whole thing has been defined in terms of a negative acceleration. A negative acceleration is a deceleration. Everything is a deceleration. So matter provides deceleration because on the right-hand side, it stays negative. Radiation, like light, provides a deceleration because everything on the right stays negative. However, for dark energy, if you plug in a minus one into W and you see just the components, so make it just like the only W component, the big sigma says we're going to add together normal matter and radiation and dark energy or anything else. We don't even care. We just have to know what its W is. Maybe there's some crazy sort of thing where the W is equal to like four or minus, a, minus one third, or maybe it's equal to like uh, one half or something. Maybe there's a different W. So you have to say, oh, the energy density of the stuff that is W equals one half. But so far, there's only really three things that we care about. Normal matter, light, and maybe dark energy or cosmological constant. So notice that if you plug in minus one for W and consider only that and get rid of the sigma with the W below it, then it becomes positive and it's an acceleration as opposed to deceleration. And that kind of helps because when de well, because when Einstein first created the cosmological constant, remember he thought it was done to balance against the pull due to matter. Because matter would pull as a negative. So he said, let's throw in a cosmological constant and have it be this stuff that pulls, that pushes. And so he said that would be a negative one. And that's where it comes from. That's why even anybody was even thinking about it. Now the acceleration equation can be twisted and turned around and something can be done slightly differently. We can define it in terms of the deceleration parameter. This equation can be defined that way. So let's see how we can do if we do that. If we define that equation in terms of the deceleration parameter, Q0, and instead of energy density, we use the density parameters, those omegas, which means how are they compared to the critical density? And we would say the sum of all of the omegas at, of different, different components, Ws, times whatever that fracting off is to the right. That gives you the deceleration parameter. So let's see what that equation looks like more simplified. The deceleration parameter for normal matter, remember W0, for radiation, it's one-third, and dark energy or cosmological constant is minus one. Now, cosmological constant, I graded out because that lambda would be constitute, would make the dark cosmological constant. And that's what Einstein did to put in there. And he said, oh, there's no evidence for it. And once he found the Hubble's expansion later, because Einstein thought the universe had to be static. So he plugged that in in order to, to give something to, to keep the universe from collapsing. It's because he figured, oh, the universe is out there. It must be collapsing. So I'm going to push, put this thing in there to force it apart. And that's the cosmological constant, which has a W of minus 1. So what he did is he tossed that in there. And so in Einstein's tradition, he lay, when he found out about the expansion of the universe, he said, oh, this is terrible. This was the greatest blunder of my career. So he removed, he disavowed the cosmological constant. But he wrote about it and talked about it, and the mathematics was done, so people kept it around just as, you know, put it on the shelf. 
So, but, but after Einstein, people said, well, there's no, they didn't think of that anymore. They didn't think the universe was static anymore, so they didn't see a need for it. So they only thought of the first two that are not grayed out. They said, what is R for radiation and what is M for normal matter? So that is the deceleration parameters for both. And so it's like, well, okay, what's the, what constitutes how much of the critical density is there? Because if the deceleration parameter is positive, then it's decelerating. And if it's negative, then it's accelerating. So that's how we would look at this. So the question is, how much deceleration is there? How much matter is there in the cosmos? How much energy density is there from the cosmos? Because looking just at this equation, Normal matter doesn't provide a negative energy density, which is what the omega can never be. It can never be negative for matter, and it can never be neg negative for light or, or neutrinos. So the deceleration parameter must be positive if the universe is only composed of normal matter and light. And that's why I grayed out the thing to the right, because it's not yet discovered yet. So let's see what it is. So the next, the next big question for everyone was like, we got to figure out a way to measure how much stuff is in the universe to determine the deceleration parameter. And that was consumed most of cosmological study from the 1950s all the way through the 1990s. It was a 40-year quest to understand both the Hubble constant and the deceleration parameter. I remember that from college. It was like the, the quest for two numbers. H naught and Q naught, what are they? That determines the future of the cosmos. That was a big deal. It still is, but it's not as big a deal today as it used to be. We'll find out shortly why. So what are these things? Well, there are three sources of matter and energy density in the cosmos uh, that we know of that we can easily measure or, or for, for the purposes right now. Radiation, which is photons and a lot of cosmic neutrinos. We know neutrinos are out there in scads because of supernovas and the sun and so forth. But, the back, but all of that, the neutrinos are swamped by the, by, the, by the energy density of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And, but that's an incredibly tiny part of all the energy density because the, the, rate, the universe has stretched it, has stretched the photons to the point where they're they're microwave photons. Now, if you went back in time, there'd be a, the same number of photons, but their lengths would be not as long. Their energies would be higher. They would actually be much more dense. And that's why when we look at the early cosmos, it's radiation dominated, but the later cosmos becomes matter dominated and otherwise dominated. So the cosmic microwave background and all photons from all stars, actually photons from all stars in the universe that have ever been made and all neutrinos that have ever been made, are less energy density than the cosmic microwave background. So light doesn't do too much. And so we can basically ignore that part of the thing. So our next step is, what is this normal matter? And normal matter, it can be called baryonic matter. And that's kind of a weird word, but I'm not going to get into why it's called that. But baryonic matter is like gas and molecules and stars and planets and people. So that's baryonic matter, normal stuff that you stub your toe on and that you eat for breakfast. That's baryonic matter. So the current measurements of normal baryonic matter across the entire universe are about 5% or 4.9% uh, of the critical density of the universe is in the form of baryonic matter. And that is interesting because if we say then most of the baryonic matter that we would encounter, planets are really small compared to stars. So if we then say, what is the, bar what is the contribution of baryonic matter from stars, which is like the sun and Sirius and Betelgeuse, that's really tiny. That's four percent, four tenths of one percent. So most of the baryonic matter is in the form of, of hot interstellar and intergalactic gas. So stars make up almost just like only 10% of the normal stuff. So most of the baryons are form of intergalactic hot hydrogen and iron gas permeating the galaxy clusters. And that's what we saw in cluster physics previously. However, we found that dark matter, because of cluster dynamics and, and how the Milky Way is rotating and how cl galaxy clusters fit together, that actually galaxy clusters show that dark matter constitutes about 26% or, or is 26% of the critical density. 
So essentially adding everything up there, so dark matter dominates the total matter content of the universe today. So of all matter, the, if you add it all up, it gives you only 27% of the critical density. So it's not enough to make the universe flat. It's less than flat. It's ex it, so therefore it is under the, the crit, it's an under critical density universe. So what does that mean? So the universe would be matter dominated. If the universe were matter dominated, then the total density of the universe right now, that's what omega sub naught means, is basically equal to the matter density, which is 27% of the critical density. That means it's less than one, and it's too little to stop the expansion. That means the universe would have an open hyperbolic geometry. That's we saw that with that weird saddle shape. There's no funny effects like the like the like the spherical geometry, and it would be it would be open and it would expand forever. And because there's matter in it, that expansion forever would decrease very steadily. And that's if you only have that in it. And during the 1990s, when I was in grad school, that was exactly the state of affairs. And the main goal of cosmology was to actually determine this de deceleration parameter and prove whether or not this is true and see by looking at the global deceleration parameter across the entire universe, whether or not this was going to hold up everywhere. Because cluster dynamics were one thing, Milky Way rotation is another, but let's look at the entire universe and see if we can figure that out. All right, so how can we detect the deceleration? Well, first things first, we've got to have a couple things. We're going to now write, we can say, the proper distance. So we want to know, to get deceleration, we need to know how fast two things are rushing apart or falling together. We want to say, how far are they now? How far were they then? How far are they, how fast are they going apart? And that concept relates to an idea of farness. And the base idea of far is called the proper distance. And the proper distance in cosmology is to say, stop the universe. Imagine you could stop the universe's expansion. Just imagine you could do that. Just uh, put on the brakes for, for as long as it takes and lay down a whole bunch of sticks to determine the distance to something. And that's called the proper distance. So you, what you do is you'd stop the universe's expansion for a short period of time and then you'd say, what's the redshift to that object? And that's the Z in this equation. And what is the measurement of a bunch of Zs? And you'd have a proper distance to all of those things. Maybe you see, you know how bright something is in there. Like somebody put 100, 100 billion, exactly 10, 100 billion uh, uh, watt light bulb in each galaxy. And because each one is exactly 100 billion watts, you know how bright it should be. So since you know how bright it should be, you know the distance, the proper distance, because how bright it is. All right, so that would give you this. However, we don't actually, we can't stop this. So the proper distance assumes that we can do this, but if you could somehow measure down the ruler sticks, that would be the proper distance, and then you'd measure the redshift from that galaxy to that galaxy at that moment that you laid down all the meter sticks, and that would give you, for a large number of objects, a statistical study that would give you H0 and Q0. However, what we can actually use that's better is called the luminosity distance. The luminosity distance is actually um, related to the proper distance, which is what you really want to get. You really want to get the proper distance, but the luminosity distance is related to the proper distance. Lumin luminosity distance is what I just said a second ago. Imagine you know how bright something is. How bright does it appear to be? Now, that is dependent upon the distance. Remember, the distance is changing. Since the distance is changing, then it is affected by the redshift. The redshift, the expansion of the universe actually affects that. So you have to take that into account. So the, the brightness or the distance you would measure by knowing how bright something is and then measuring how bright it appears is affected by the redshift. So you have to fold that in. That's where that one plus C comes from. And that's approximately equal to a slightly different equation. They're almost identical. You can see how the minuses and pluses are swapped. So they're almost identical. So that's the approximation equation. And so when you measure something, you want to find something that is where you know how bright it is. And that's what Hubble did. He knew how bright the Cepheids were.
because Henry and Levitt created the period luminosity relationship. And so if you have a period luminosity relationship, you're measuring the luminosity distance. However, at very small redshift, they're the same thing. I mean, if you look closely at this thing, you see a z squared in there. So a small redshift, a z times a z, is going to be even smaller. So it's approximately just the thing that Hubble did. And Hubble only looked at small redshifts. So he did, could never have perceived the, uh, the, ex, ex, the deceleration parameter at all in anything because he was looking at things that were simply too close. Tens or hundreds of megaparsecs is simply too close to measure the deceleration parameter. Isn't that wild? We have to get something larger than 100 megaparsecs to begin to see this. So we need something really, really, really bright. So Hubble measured a very small, uh, measured close by, and that's why we see the little equation down on the right. Because that's because we take a z, because in the, in the approximation that we have in the middle, the z times a z is going to be really small. So the deceleration parameter basically gets hidden by looking nearby. So what do we got to do? We have to look at high, high redshift, very large redshift, so that, so that we can actually perceive the de deceleration parameter. How do we do that? Well, first, we're going to find a population of things called standard candles that we know their luminosities. Uh, Hubble used the Cepheid variables. We can use other things. When we talked about the Tully-Fisher relationship in the past, we talked about type 1a supernovae as well. And, other, and supernovae and brightest red stars, uh, surface brightness relationships, any number of things, the brightness of the core of a galaxy, uh, the rotational speed, the, the profile of an elliptical galaxy. There's many ways to do this. Some are better than others. Some are really good. Some are really bad. But, you know, these things are millions or light years away, and they're looking at stars in large numbers, so it's going to be kind of a trick to get anything anyway. But let's pretend we can. So you measure the redshift to that thing and measure the flux, which is the brightness, uh, the brightness that you get with for every standard candle, whatever that standard candle is. And then you compute the distance, the luminosity distance, d sub l. And then you know what the luminosity of the thing is a priori because you know how bright it is from physics. Physics says this thing must be this bright. Okay, you, co you compute the distance based on the measurement you take with the flux and the redshift you take, and that gets you that for every single one of your standard candles. You then make a plot of the redshift, C times the redshift, versus the uh, luminosity distance, and that gives you the slope of that line gives you gives you uh when it's very 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 low that's going to give you the h sub naught when it's low low redshift and this process that we just described those six steps that's what hubble did that's how hubble did this with the cepheid variables and that gets you out to about 100 megaparsecs to get farther than that to see deviations from a straight line the plot cz versus dl it won't be straight, or it's not necessarily straight, once you get farther than 100 megaparsecs, because we want to see that deceleration parameter. So let's see if we can find it. And let's use a particularly bright object called a type 1a supernovae. And we know that these type 1a supernovae are good standard candles because they always, these supernovae, these white dwarfs explode when they reach their Chandrasekhar limit, they explode when they get 10 molecules, 10 atoms too many. So they're extraordinarily luminous, and therefore we can see them from when they're really, really far away. They have a specific kind of spectrum, and they're different from type 2 supernovae, and they also have a different light curve, so we can distinguish them. So you can distinguish a type 1 from a type 2. However, it's also expected that binary stars would actually be more common than supermassive stars. So an extraordinarily bright type 2 supernova should be less common in general than a type 1a. Why? Because, remember, 60% of the stars in the sky are binaries, and a significant fraction of them are spectroscopic binaries. And as we saw way early in the course, is that binaries are really common, but supermassive stars are not. So a star that would become a white dwarf is common. A star that will become a neutron star is not. So you can have a binary star pair, one of them becomes a white dwarf, and then the other one dumps stuff onto it. So you should, in general, expect to see, if it's a supernova, it's more, li more likely than not to be a type 1a supernova. So even if you make the mistake, it's still a pretty good mistake to make. 
All right. So this was a big search. This was an enormous, enormous undertaking. And because here's some e images. Uh, this was taken by Reese et al. Uh, with his pro with his process using using the Hubble Space Telescope as well as stuff on the ground. But these are Hubble images showing supernovae in distant, distant galaxies. And the arrows indicate where they are. Uh, so there's befores and afters where the supernova was discovered. Basically, point you a very sensitive telescope at lots of different galaxies in the sky, make a make a big search, then go back to see if anything has appeared there that's different, and go back repeatedly. So you're going to go back and forth and back and forth amongst many, many, many galaxies and try to get as many as you can and see if you can find any. Well, the answer is they did. And here's some more. Here's some more ones, those little dots in the center of each one. Those are some. And then there's more. And there's a bunch of them floating around, and there's even more. So there's a lot of these things that we're seeing. And so the type 1a supernovae, there's roughly one every, you know, thousand years or so in a given galaxy. So all you have to do is go hunt for enough galaxies. If you look at a thousand galaxies, you should see one. So if you look at 10,000 galaxies, you should, should see 10. That's kind of the idea. So now we actually ask the question, are they really the same? Are all these exactly the same thing? Because if they're not the same thing, then they're not a standard candle, and we can't do that. So what we do is we say, let's look at the light curves for all of these standard candles. And each of the colored dots indicates a time that they were looked at and when they were caught at their brightness. So brightness is up and down, and time is left and right, with, with the time progressing from left to right, and brightness going up and down. And if it's the same color, it's the same supernova. So you can see that there's many different colors. They all follow the same curve. Since they all follow the same curve, they must be the same kind of object. Now I do mention something about a stress, stretch factor here, and that's because the time gets stretched too. Remember there's the, that redshift stretches times too, because it's stretching the frequency as well as the wavelength of the light. So it'll stretch the length of the curve, but once you take that into account, they're all the same. So type 1a supernovae, this is this curve showing a plot of the type 1a supernovae over a large group definitely tells us that yes, we're actually onto something by saying these actually are standard candles. So let's keep going. So here's what you can do. Let's go all the way back to our first, first, first thing. We talked about brightnesses and distances and things. Remember, these, this is called the distance modulus equation. So we're digging this way up from way back in the first section we talked about distances and, and magnitudes. So the first things on the left-hand side are the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude. And then there's the logarithm base 10. And there's the distance, the luminosity distance to the object in megaparsecs. Now we're not just doing parsecs, but we're doing in megaparsecs. Because we're doing in megaparsecs, we instead of adding 5, we add 25. So we then get a distance modulus, which is m minus m. So we, we just get the, that, that distance modulus is the thing that we care about. And because m, the capital M is the absolute luminosity or absolute magnitude, that's going to be our thing that we say, oh, this is what the absolute magnitude is. And we can say, what's the apparent magnitude? So m minus m gives us the, di the and knowing the luminosity distance based on the redshift, we can get a lot of information. For example, though, we can say, what's the distance modulus to the Large Magellanic Cloud is about 18 and a half. And then the distance modulus to the Virgo cluster, since it's 15 megaparsecs, that's distance modulus is 30.9. So clearly, the farther things are, the larger the distance modulus number is. So we can get a whole bunch of distance moduli for things at different distances. So the distance modulus is then only dependent on the absolute, on the apparent magnitude, right? So if you measure the apparent magnitude and you know what the distance is based on the if, if by that, we can get the absolute. We get, or we know we know that we can we can curl everything around to make sure we got the right thing. But that's not a hundred percent because we're not measuring distances. We're measuring redshifts, right? We're associating redshift with distance. We're or we're trying to at least. So let's see how we can do that. So we measure brightness and we measure redshift and we posit the idea of absolute luminosity. So we're going to combine this extragalactic distance modulus equation, not just the normal distance one, but for extragalactic distances on megaparsecs or more. And then we can plug that 
distance modulus equation, or the specifically the d sub l, which is the, the luminosity distance, into this pro equation. Just combine these two things, plug the dl into the equation above, and make some approximations and yada yada yada. And then what we get is that we find that the distance modulus equation with respect to redshift as opposed to d sub l is rather simple. We have for that, well, it looks kind of complicated, but it's a sum of terms. And we have the Hubble parameter in there. We have the deceleration parameter in there. There's our Q naught and our H naught. We uh, try to get a, a handle on the M, the capital M, which is the absolute luminosity. And we measure the apparent magnitude, which is little m. So if we know the absolute luminosity, capital M, and we can measure the redshift, Z, we can measure little m and measure z and do this a whole, for a huge number of things. It's basically a linear plot. Notice this looks linear in, or logarithmically linear, in the, in the redshift. Notice there's a log base 10 of the z and then there's a, there is also a, um, there's also a, a, just a, a linear relationship with respect to z as well. That's dependent on the, the deceleration parameter. So if you have enough stuff, you can make a line and see what numbers for H naught and Q naught fit. That's all you do. And that's what was done. So here is the plot from Reese et al. And uh, Adam Reese and his team with the high, supernova, high Z supernova search team in 1998, as well as Saul Perlmutter and his team with the Supernova Cosmology Project in 1999. These two things were, were published together. And this distance modulus as a function of redshift for these objects for extraordinarily high redshift out to about one. On the right hand side is almost a redshift of one. And what we're looking at here is that there's three lines going through the graph. And one of them is the critical mass density. Remember we related the deceleration parameter to the content of the universe. We could have put that in there too. So we just went the deceleration parameter, just did that. But if we then say, what's the best fit deceleration parameter to this stuff? It's kind of hard to tell from this graph, but let's say we remove or normalize it to what we thought we knew. Because remember, the expected amount was about 30%. So the middle thing with the triple dots, 0.3 and no, dark, no cosmological constant, which is uh, lambda, omega sub lambda, there's no energy contribution from that. And the matter contribution, omega sub m, is about 30% of the critical density. That's the thing that everybody thought from the 1950s through the 1990s. So getting the exact value of the deceleration parameter was tricky. And as you can see, it's very tricky from this because each of these dots is a data point and the, and the little bars up and down from it, those are the error bars associated with it. But let's normalize this to the look when we just say, ah, let's see, let's just go around the point three. So let's actually take a slightly different view of it. And the dotted line again is the is the critical dent is the total matter density compared to the critical density, which is 0.3. And that's the dotted line going across the middle. The, the flat universe with critical with mass what made a flat universe is the sol is the is the deep dashed line going that arcs to the bottom. Notice it kind of goes across and across and across and then arcs down at the bottom. So it's the one that meets the right hand side really low, the one I have not indicated with a green arrow. The best fit for the data that they have is one where we have a flat universe and that the omega sub lambda is 0.7. So the best possible fit to all that data, you know, it kind of looks scraggly, but it certainly isn't, there has to be something there that's, that's different than matter. That's kind of scary. So they're best fit to the data, and this is the data from the 1999 and 2000 papers and so forth and 98. This is the discovery papers where they said the best fit includes a, an energy density of 70% of the critical density for the cosmological constant. And this is the data that they showed. So what about a cosmological constant? Let's go back to that equation that we have where we demonstrated it. We find, oh, okay, what do we get? Well, that, what does that mean? It says that if the matter and energy density is close to 0.3 and if the density of the vacuum energy or the cosmological constant is 0.7, then the deceleration parameter is negative 0.55. A negative deceleration parameter is an acceleration. 
that's an acceleration because it was defined in terms of deceleration. So a positive Q naught is a deceleration and a negative Q naught is an acceleration. So the best fit to the data was one where there was, where their deceleration is an acceleration. Now this is important because there are a lot of different ways that the deceleration parameter could have been measured. There's lots of different possibilities for the for how the universe can go in the future and how it can go in the past, but only measuring it can get you there. There are some toy universes, and we call them toys because they don't really happen, where we have a negative cosmological constant, it recollapses, or maybe there was no Big Bang and it just went down to a minimum size and came, well, like it started big, collapsed down to a minimum size, and re-expanded so there just didn't get to zero size. Or maybe it was it had a Big Bang really long ago and it didn't do anything for a very, very, very long time, and it coasted and expanded. And maybe there's no cosmological constant and so forth. But the, what the measurements are showing is that there is a positive cosmological constant which makes the universe expand forever and accelerate. So that is the discovery of dark energy. And so their best fit to the data, and that's what those arcing curves are all about. Remember how the data points were there? They tried to do their best statistical study to say what is the highest likelihood. And the and Reese and Perlmutter were competing teams. Uh, Perlmutter's team was called the Supernova Cosmology Project, and Reese's team was called is called the High Z Supernova Project. And their values are overlap quite well. And the old idea that I dealt with when I was in college is on the green line, where there is no cosmological constant, and so we would all it would be in the decelerating universe parameter space. See how that decelerating is below the dot dot dot, and the accelerating is above the dot dot dot. So if there is a positive cosmological constant, and it is larger than zero then the universe will likely accelerate. I mean, if it's not too big and there's a lot more matter, then it could still have, could decelerate eventually. But the funny thing is, is it lies right on that their measurement, lies right on the flat universe line, which is between closed and open, but it definitely lies above the accelerating thing. So we find that it's definitely not a no Big Bang, like a bounce universe. It's definitely, because that's way up high. So you have to have a huge cosmological constant, which is not seen in the measurements. So that's not, that did not happen. So there, are, there was some Big Bang. However, the universe is now has some component that is causing it to expand and expand and expand. The, the ovals show their best statistical fit to the data. And that's what that means. So here's something that they wrote up uh, that came out in Physics Today, uh, and this is this shows more about the nature of when the redshifts were dot and where their dots are, and you can see that the higher the redshift, the farther back it goes. And looking at that, we can see that the universe had first decelerated, then accelerated, or basically has been accelerating since about 5 billion years ago. It's definitely in the expanding forever category as we look in the farther and farther past. And it also is definitely in the farther ago. So really, when you look at the distance modules, all it said was is that the things were dimmer than they should have been. The supernovae were dimmer than they should have been. So that meant they were far, they're farther away now than expected. So the universe must be accelerating. That's basically what was found with the distance modules. They were fainter. At a given redshift, they were fainter. And the farther, the bigger the redshift, the fainter they were as expected. That's what that means. So if we found their galaxies redshift in there, we could discover that basically that the universe has some sort of vacuum energy and it's likely accelerating. And that's what was found by Perlmutter and Schmidt and Reese. So Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese were the supernova, I'm sorry, I kept admitting, emitting, omitting uh, Brian Schmidt from it. But Schmidt and Reese were the supernova team, high Z supernova search team, and Saul Perlmutter uh, led the supernova cosmology project. All right, so the next thing we see is here's from the supernova cosmology products data themselves. And zooming in a bit, I have a slightly different view of that. And we see from supernova cosmology product uh, only from their material, they say that it's about 0.28 and 0.72. No matter what, both teams agree that there must be something like that. And there's a very interesting story that you can find if you go hunting around about the nature of how this was discovered. 
Basically, there was an illicit email that caused quite a kerfuffle between team members who communicated to each other without going through the highest end people. So basically, they one person tipped the other's hand. They were competing to get this information and they basically tipped each other's hand. And as a result of it, both teams got the Nobel Prize as opposed to only one. So if one guy or a few guys had kept their mouth shut, then likely only one of these teams would have gotten it because they would have announced it first. In any event, because they essentially jointly announced it, they jointly won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for discovering the acceleration of the expansion of the universe and opening the window into the new physics of understanding what the heck this dark energy stuff was. So that's not just from supernovae. In fact, the supernova results combined with other things, constraints by the cosmo uh, by from the cosmic microwave background uh, missions, such as Planck and WMAP that look at the cosmic microwave background, as well as extensive studies of galaxy clusters like BOSS, give and uh, specifically uh, later and much more accurate, much more much more precise results of being about 0.32% or 0.3166 of the critical density for matter. And this has come specifically from, this comes specifically from the Cosmo, from, from June of 2018 from the Planck team. Uh, that's what that archive link is for, is 0.6847. So if you add those two up, it's almost exactly one. They give a, almost exactly one, which is really nuts. It's almost, it's one plus or minus. I didn't get the error bars in there, but we add the error bars in there. It's pretty much one. So the cosmological cosmic microwave background studies, as well as galaxy cluster studies, support the idea that was found in this, which is a completely independent concept. Looking at the, the background light of the cosmos, it's very different than studying the other. And cosmic microwave backgrounds does that by looking at the distribution of lumps and bumps inside the cop in there. And galaxy clusters look at how fast galaxy clusters appear to be, how the size and scale of galaxy clusters across the cosmos. So all of these things taken together say, say the same thing, that there is something called dark energy, which nobody knows what the heck it is. Nobody knows what dark energy is. Nobody has any freaking clue what it is. No one knows. The simplest concept is it's probably a cosmological constant, and that means it's a W of minus one. And that cosmological constant would simply mean that there's a vacuum energy component, meaning the, the very sp that the thing that we call space, the thing that we call space-time, has energy associated with just being space-time. That is a constant, and so there's just so much stuff of energy that is part of it. And that's what a cosmological constant is. So as the universe expands, there's more space. So therefore, it, since it's constant, it doesn't dilute. So every box of space has the same amount of cosmological constant. So once you get diluted, once the matter gets diluted, you're only left with cosmological constant. So that's what's happening in the future. It's a very strange thing. And nobody knows what it is. It could be some other kind of dark energy, though, and people have tried to figure out exactly what the W is for dark energy. What is it exactly minus one? Is it a little less than that? Is it a little more than that? Remember, W is not, doesn't have to be minus one. It can be something else. So that's another thing that's been checked. Um, there's all sorts of weird things that it can be called that it can maybe the nature of the cosmological constant changes with time. Maybe it's only minus one over here. Maybe it's minus oh five over there. Maybe it's a whole bunch of things. So you could call it scalar fields or quintessence or lots of different things. A lot of them have to do with it changing with time or being different at different locations in the cosmos. But the Planck team, looking at their data, this comes from the July 2018 paper I referenced, says that they they measure that the that the w or the uh, or, or what the, the basically the equation of state what the equation of state is for the um, for it is that it's pretty close to minus 1 and they're hoping and that the other thing is it could be that if it's not minus 1 if it's less than minus 1 say it's like minus 2 or something then we would call that a phantom energy and that's a really weird thing but right now the current consensus is that the universe is composed of a minus a cosmological constant, which takes up 70% of the universe's material, 68%, and matter and dark matter 
composed 32%, and that the universe is flat. So our universe is geom geometrically flat. It's not hyperbolic shaped. It's not spherical shaped. It's, it's neither open nor closed. It is flat. And it is accelerating. It is a flat, accelerating, and infinite universe. And that's what we live in. And so dark matter composes 26, 26 .8, at the current date, 26.8% of the energy density of the cosmos. Normal matter is about 4.9%, but dark energy composes about 68% of the cosmos's, the entire universe's energy density. And as the universe expands, dark matter and ordinary matter will be diluted, and so those numbers will drop until dark energy becomes everything. Becomes everything. So that's our current energy budget. Only 5% of the universe is ordinary matter. And of that ordinary matter, only 10% of it, or 0.4%, half a percent, is stars. So the rest of the ordinary matter is just intergalactic gas, so hydrogen gas, or basically hydrogen at extreme heat. So ordinary matter is not even planets. Ordinary matter is mostly inter intergalactic gas. The rest of it is, the rest of normal matter is dark matter that doesn't interact with light in any way. And dark energy, we have no idea what it is. All we know is that it's forcing the universe apart and it forcing it to accelerate and it ends expansion. All right, so that's where we get the cut. And so there is what we get from, from all these strange things. And really, no one knows what dark energy is. It's presumed that you can't actually make a box out of dark energy and you can't box it into anything. But even though it's everywhere, and it's uh, inherent to space-time itself. That leads us to what to say, what's going to happen in the future of the universe? So what will happen? So today in the future of the universe, because if the universe is going to do that, it's expanding, accelerating, what's going to happen? Well, today there's stars, stars that are metal rich, more stars explode. If they explode, they make stuff. And then that makes, there's a little less hydrogen as time goes on, but there's pretty stars and planets and things like that. And white dwarfs are made and neutron stars and black holes, but things get locked up in those things. So in about 6 billion years or so, the sun is going to be gone. It'll become a white dwarf. And you know, it's going to be sad, but right now we're calling this the stellariferous era. Stars can be made and born in galaxies. And they they can be there. Multiple generations of stars can be made, and that's the current day, thirteen point eight billion years after the start of the Big Bang. However, in about a trillion years, which is a long time from now, about a thousand times the current age of the universe, current a thousand current universe ages from now, the matter will be locked up in in white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes. And that will to and that will be all done. All star birth will come to an end. There will be no free hydrogen gas anywhere. And the last of the red dwarfs, those little tiny M-type dwarf stars, will burn out and become really, really, really low mass white dwarfs. They will become the tiniest, coldest objects, and all the rest of things will be in black dwarfs or cold neutron stars and black holes. And all the stars will fade into a deep, deep night, and that will be the end of the era of starlight. All stars will go out. There will be no galaxy light. There will be no light from galaxies that come from starlight. So star formation will be done in a trillion years. Needless to say, that pretty much puts the kibosh on pretty much everything. In fact, we can go about a hundred times farther if you wish to kind of think about it. The cosmos won't have any sources of energy in about a hundred trillion years, in 10 to the 14th years, um, and to support any kind of complex interplay of life. So no matter what, after the universe has become 10 to the 14th years old, currently it's 10 to the 10th, so 10,000 times the age of the universe today, there will be no capacity for life to exist anywhere in the universe because of the loss of energy. After a thousand times more of those times, <laughs> the solar system would evaporate due to interactions. Not evaporate like stars, like the planets themselves would come apart, but simply random interactions between the moon and dust and asteroids and Jupiter and Saturn and Mercury or whatever's left in the, in the solar system and every solar system in the universe, of which we know there are many through the Kepler Space Telescope. 
they eventually would be scattered. So planets would be scattered out into the interstellar, into the galactic medium that is now very dark. Or if they didn't get scattered, they get swallowed up by the white dwarf or neutron star that makes up their whatever they're at. So wide binary systems are broken apart. So everything is now evenly distributed and they're all, or anything that's close gets, gets pulled together. Anything that's far gets flung apart. And so the expanding universe do, just means that these rare, 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 rare things where a planet might go by another planet, get flung out. They, it takes a long time for something like that to happen. But 10 to the 17th years is a catastrophically long time because that's 100,000 times more time than the current length of the universe now. After 10 to the 27th years, which is 100 billion times longer than that, ugh, so we have to go 100 billion times more of those in order to get to the point where galaxies themselves, not just, not just the get spread apart because of interactions between stellar remnants such as black holes and dead neutron stars, and almost everything gets ejected and uh, out from them, and they just go out. And so now there's no such thing as a galaxy anymore, and the rest is he falling into the supermassive black holes at the center. Some of those things, uh, if they coalesce into that supermassive black hole, the largest would become up to 100, 100 trillion solar masses, which is much larger by a factor of a thousand than any of the other, any, any current um, uh, so, supermassive black hole known. So galaxies would eventually spread out and not be recognizable in 10 to the 27th years. Even farther in the future than that, after 10 to the 32nd years, which is now, wow, really far, 10 to the, 20, 10 to the 22nd times the current age of the cosmos, it is thought that protons themselves would be unstable. And if they are unstable, they would decay into electrons and positrons and neutrinos and maybe even pions or something like that which means that protons would disappear and matter would simply fall apart. And if matter falls apart, if it's not in a black hole, anything that's matter stops being what we call matter and basically becomes positrons, electrons, and neutrinos. And that's all we're left with. So that's going to be long, and nobody really has ever seen this decay, but it's possible that it's going to happen because, you know, the strong nuclear force allows for things to happen, but it, the probability is extraordinarily rare. After an extraordinarily long period of time, 10 to the 67th years, stellar mass black holes evaporate by emitting Hawking radiation, and after 10 to the 106th years, supermassive black holes evaporate by Hawking radiation. This is enormous, enormous, enormous ending, and that is the end of all organized matter in any way. All that's left in the cosmos now is an accelerating, rapidly accelerating cosmos filled or only gently filled with extremely long wavelengths of light and neutrinos and electrons and positrons. So after they're all evaporated, the universe has basically cooled off to a temperature of absolute zero. The only thing that's left is a formless thin gas of electrons, positrons, and neutrinos, and they're spaced apart by hundreds of megaparsecs, so they're not really touching the radiation, the light, is incredibly uh, redshifted photons, and in fact, the, probably the photons themselves would be much larger than the size scale of the universe today. Uh, then, so they would basically not even feel like photons to us. They would be very, very old, and the lar and the exponential expansion would make it very, very, very cold, very, very empty, with nothing in it. So, a size scale of something like our current universe might contain one electron and might contain one neutrino and one photon. That's what's to happen in about 10 to the 160 years, and probably that's a very large number of one of each at that time. Probably none, probably nothing. It will all expand away. So that's kind of the heat death of the universe. There won't be nothing left. There won't be anything left. It'll just be cool, cold, and empty, and continuing to expand, and space will be bigger and bigger and bigger. However, if the equation of state of dark energy is less than minus one, then it's still observationally possible, but it's not quite probable because of the most recent stuff that's come out by the Planck team. Then we have a phantom energy, and it would eventually rip the universe apart in about 14 trillion years, 
where the expansion of the universe would be so fast that it would overcome the ability of the electrostatic force, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force to respond to the expansion of space-time. And the right before this, if the phantom energy was just minus 0 0.001, if W was just a little bit less than 1, the universe is done in 14 trillion years, like really done. Or more like 20 or so trillion years. So it's going to take a while, but it'll happen. It'll rip itself apart. 60 million years before that, the Milky Way is torn apart by the expansion of the universe. Three months, the solar system flies apart. 30 minutes before, the Earth explodes because of the expansion of the universe. And 10 to the minus 19 seconds before the rip, atoms themselves are torn apart. And it becomes kind of an inverse singularity like we had with the Big Bang, but it's just the universe expanding, expanding with nothing in it. That's a big rip. However, the Planck probe shows that we're in a flat, accelerating cosmos and not one with phantom energy. So this is very interesting to talk about, but it's probably not what it is. So the possible fates of the universe, some say the world will end in fire, some will say in ice, but what, from what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if I had to perish twice and think I know enough of hate to say that destruction ice is also great and would suffice. And will the world ang end with a bang or a whimper? is the real question. We don't know, but it's looking, it's, it seems like the world will end in ice, essentially. Not even in ice. Ice won't even be there. It'll be emptiness and cold. And so the end is a whimper, a tiny, tiny nothingness. How's that for you for an afternoon? Now, if we look then to the largest size scales and say outside of our cosmos, it's called beyond the particle horizon, meaning beyond everything universe, what we can possibly know what we can possibly measure, not know, but measure. There are lots of different things that we can talk about that we could go over in extended things. So I leave this as a list to you to go over and go hunt down because this is really some interesting stuff for you to go investigate and learn about. Because to me, this has always been some of the most interesting things like the chaotic inflation, meaning maybe the inflation happened here or maybe it happened there. Uh, the concept and it'll happen here. And maybe it'll happen again. So chaotic inflation has a, has a very interesting concept. The concept of the land escape, meaning that there are many, 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 many universes, and the universe is much, much larger than our observable horizon. And there's an, the vast area where universes pinch off and expand from each other, but maybe they have different physical constants. Maybe the constant of the speed of light is different, or the charge in electron is different. But then that leads to the concept of the anthropic principle, which is, hmm, our universe is funny. It has life in it. And all, if you change any one of those constants by a little bit, we ain't got nothing. Big number theory has some very strange things that say there must be some relationship between the big, big, big numbers because they all tend to be big and all the same rough value. The uh, Poincaré recurrence says, well, if you let the universe age long enough, you eventually get the same stuff again. But that seems to be eliminated by the fact that dark energy is going to push everything apart. Multiverse concepts and brain theories posit that there is, are additional spatial dimensions that we do not perceive that then are literally right next to us. But since we don't perceive them, the only thing that leaks across is maybe gravity, and that would be what we call a brain. So those are mem as in membranes. So there'd be multiverses with the brain, the different the distance between them is millimeters, but in every direction. But we can't get there because but maybe gravity reaches through. And that leads us to the concepts of like the many world string theory. And also the concept of many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that every action you do creates a new universe. And that's an actual interpretation of quantum mechanics because of the nature of choice. String theory uh, supports the concept of brain theory, which says that the fundamental things aren't atoms, but these tiny things that are strings that are 11 dimensional objects that are only, you can only perceive their 11 dimensions if you're down on the size scale of 10 to the minus 43rd meters or so. For fun and enjoyment, I invite you to go look at uh, author Greg Egan's uh, science fiction novel, Diaspora, which looks at all of these things that we just talked about in a very really, really heady way. It's one of the most hard sci-fi novels, but I, I encourage you to go take a look at it. And I think that's a, that's a great way to end it, uh, to give you something to go explore, because even as the universe is ending, we still have so many questions about the nature of nature. See you soon.